Hello. Hello, are we recording already? Oh, Hello. Because I'm, we'll talk about it, but I don't want to have any issues. So I'll cut the first part out. And whenever you say hi, welcome, that's going to be the beginning. But yes. um, so I'm, so I'm traveling. So I just want to make you host co-host. So there's no any issues and stuff. Yes. Uh, yes. I was just going to say that. Why don't you make me host and, yes. um, or oh, either way. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. have to be a co-host to share it, don't I? Yes. No, no, you uh, you should. Can I just be check really quickly to see if it works. Here, I'm making yeah. you a co-host anyway, but yeah, see if you share. Can uh, you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And sorry that I'm because we had, uh, we had so many issues in the last two weeks. So I was just like, I want to make sure this works well, recorded, hosting everything. <laughs> It's been crazy. How are you doing? Um, I'm no host yet. Just no, I know, I know. And here you are. <laughs> okay. And I lost my hosting privileges. So, hello everyone. I'm Devina, and thank you for joining us today at the Media Club. On behalf of the Media Education Lab, I welcome you. Just some quick announcements before we begin. We are recording this Zoom meeting for our archives. Please turn off your microphones and videos so we have minimum lag on the meeting. Um, you can enable closed captions option below by scrolling down to your Zoom meeting controls. Um, you can also use the chat to introduce yourselves, um, which part of the world you're coming from. Um, try and keep the chat relevant to the session. Um, today, we're celebrating World Environment Day with a special media club meeting with Professor Antonio Lopez, who will be talking about his chapter, Global Perspective and Eco-Media Literacy, Eco-Justice in Media Education in a Post-Pandemic World that he co-wrote with Professor Teresa Redmond and Dr. Jeff Scher. Uh, link to the chapter will be in the chat in a minute. Um, Antonio Lopez is Professor of Communications and Media Studies at the John Cabot University in Rome, Italy, uh, and he's written extensively on Eco-Media Literacy, and has also spoken at the Media Club before, so we're very glad to have you back. Uh, welcome. Um, over to you, Professor Lopez. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so pleased to be here, and it's true, I've been to this um, venue before, and I see some familiar faces and names, so hello to all of you. And um, I know that some of you have seen my work before, and I'm going to try to not bore you with rehashing the same material um, and I, I do plan on um, offering you some new stuff that I've been working on. And I'm sorry, I'm going to turn my phone off um, so it doesn't bother us while we're doing it. There we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump right into it because um, I need to <clears throat> also sort of go over some uh, basics to the, for the, the framework that I've developed. And, um, and then I'll go into some of the newer stuff. So um, let me just do my screen share. And here we are. Okay, there we go. So um, I wanna start by uh, sharing with you some news uh, so that I'm very excited about, which is um, I'm the co-editor, actually the lead editor of another handbook by Routledge called the Routledge Handbook of Ecomedia Studies. It's going to be out in September. And um, this will be a very good resource for anyone who uh, is interested in the topic. And there'll be lots of introductory background articles and um, it will be open access. So um, you will be able to access it from anywhere in the world. So there are a few insights from the, from the work in the book that I wanna share with you. Um, first of all, the, the way that we define media is that they are part of and about the environment. So it's not just representations of the environment, but actually coming from the environment. I'm gonna spend most of my time explaining what that means. And then Ecomedia revise and expand the definition of media. So in other words, when we think of media, we're moving beyond some of the traditional ways of thinking in terms of like mass media, screen media, et cetera. And again, I'm gonna give lots of examples to explain what I mean by that. And then Ecomedia are studied through iterative circuits consisting of diverse critical areas of Ecomedia scholarship. 
So we're bringing in many different points of view in the form of this type of analysis, which again, I will explain to you in a little bit, um, coming from many different fields that are not traditionally associated with um, media literacy. So my definition, definition of eco-media literacy, which is um, coming from my book that came out two years ago, is that <clears throat> it combines critical media literacy with the analytical to tools of eco-media studies and eco-justice. And I'm assuming that most people here are not very familiar with eco-media studies. So I wanna give you some background about that. I also just wanna offer a definition of eco slash climate justice, which is that environmental and climate struggles are intersectional with social justice. So when we talk about the environment, we also have to take into consideration issues of class, race, gender, ableism, inequality, globalization, et cetera. And I would like to just do, as a side note, say that this is a good intervention point. I know a lot of media, media literacy people are engaging social justice, and I would just urge people to, um, when they incorporate social justice into their lessons and into their work, to also think of it in terms of uh, the climate because they're very closely related. So if we were to ask Alexis, uh, Alexa, I guess it should be Alexa, right? What are your environmental impacts? How might it respond? Well, first of all, we have to think about when we say, talk about media, we have to totally re conceptualize what we mean by media. So uh, upper left is a diagram of the various um, cables that uh, connect the continents around the world that are the backbone of our telecommunications and internet. We have satellite networks. We have uh, massive uh, warehouses that store computers. That, that's where all of our data is. This, folks, is what media really are at this point. Everything that we're engaging is going through this kind of a system. So the Ecomedia Mind and Footprint is a framework I've developed to think about, this is the part aspect of media where we say um, about the environment. So we're talking about the kind of discourses and discussions and the frameworks that are communicated about policy and what to do about the climate, for example, and the news media. Also, the impact of um, advertising on our behaviors and consumerism, and which drives very much the environmental crisis that we're in. And then the way that media serve as a form of environmental education. They teach us about our relationship with the environment. And then the way that uh, ideas and concepts about ecology are communicated through popular culture, such as films like Avatar, but also what is not discussed in the media, the ways that media don't talk about and don't confront the, you know, the most important crisis of our time, which is the climate crisis. And then disinformation, which is uh, very prevalent in social media, disinf disinformation that influences how we think about climate action and what we need to do to solve these problems. But media are also very important in coordinating and uh, getting people together to take action. So I, I don't, it's not all negative. There's of course very positive aspects of it. Then there's the educational, documentary aspects of media that teach us about environmental problems. And last but not least, the way that media impact our sense of place, space, and time. That's the Ecomedia mind print. That's the part about the environment. The Ecomedia footprint, where media are of the environment, connects to, first of all, the way that the materials are extracted from the environment such as uh, the conflict minerals in, in Congo is one place in the world, but there's many other places around the world where many of the materials, whether it's fossil fuels or lithium, are extracted to make our devices, to power our devices. Then there's the labor policies and practices that are taking place where our gadgets are manufactured, primarily in China, but not just China, of course, India, Philippines, Mexico, and so forth. <clears throat> and then, Something that uh, people may not be aware of is how our data centers are powered primarily by fossil fuels. So the data so-called cloud, which is an interesting environmental metaphor, is um, highly toxic because the majority of uh, power that is used to, um, to run all of our data and all of our systems comes from um, uh, fossil fuels. And then, and, and you may not know that the fossil, uh, sorry, the, the, the cloud, the international network of these systems 
are now emitting more CO2 than the airline industry. And then the problem of e-waste, which is um, quite substantial. So what is pushing the environmental impacts of media? Um, what trends? Uh, AI, of course, and actually I could do a whole presentation on ChatGPT. If you ever want to invite me back, I'd be happy to do that um, because all these systems require massive server power. They have to run lots of computers to uh, process these um, uh, data, to learn, to, um, um, to uh, for example, for facial and voice recognition, they have to you know, scan and read tons of photos and images and videos, cryptocurrency mining, blockchain, NFTs, frictionless online shopping, emergence of VR and meta, online gaming, ad tech, music and video streaming, and last but not least, online work and meetings, which is uh, one theme that's closely tied to the post-pandemic. So all of these are really pushing our systems, not just in terms of fossil fuel energy to power these servers, but also all the gadgets and devices that are required to power and to run these systems. So the entire global production system, I'm simplifying quite a bit, so I apologize for oversimplification, but I want to describe this system as one uh, I call the five E's. So first being uh, the process of enclosure, which is an um, in order for uh, the system to function, um, commonly shared resources such as uh, land and water have to be privatized and extracted. Um, these resources such as energy um, come from the land, extracted from land. Uh, oftentimes, originally they were indigenous territories that then through various different treaty mechanisms get privatized and those resources are then extracted and exported um, across the world. But it's not just the extraction of resources and energy, but also data and our attention. So when we talk about uh, the way that our systems are designed to extract our attention, it's the same economic model that also extracts energy and resources from the environment. And then the expendability of ecosystems and to uh, from what are declared essentially as sacrifice zones that um, certain areas of the world um, can be trashed in order to power our systems, and we that's an acceptable sacrifice for the global economy. And then along with that, disposable people. So certain populations also um, are basically designated as disposable. And then the exploitation of labor and lands, um, this idea of cheap things that, you know, the, the, the cost of doing business is um, based on exploitation primarily. And then the external age, the, the destruction and cost of the peoples and environments are externalized so that other people have to pay it. In terms of how this relates to COVID, well, uh, you know, we're still obviously don't know everything about the origins of COVID, but it's um, basically understood that when you think about viruses and future pandemics, uh, probably one of the main causes is um, biodiversity loss, because what happens um, as a result of the way that our global system is um, is driving species that normally would not have contact with humans into contact with humans because of habitat destruction. Global heating is, is affecting local ecosystems. Uh, Over-exploitation of lands, such as clear-cutting of forests or the replacement of um, rainforest or old growth forest with uh, palm um, extraction, as I already talked about. Um, pollution, which also is driving animals out of their habitats. And then um, uh, the uh, impact of non-native species in changing and transforming ecosystems. So as a result of that, um, these are essentially um, being identified as primary causes of pandemics because um, as I mentioned, that a lot of animals that normally that have these viruses that normally would not come into contact with human populations are pushed into contact with humans. And so our, uh, our whole system of gadget production and extraction that drives the media system is connected to these problems that we're talking about here. I also want to point out that one of the things that 
we notice when people talk about the pandemic, and I, I deliberately included this image on the right here as a sort of a typical representation of the health system, is that it's quite often treated as either a problem of nature or a problem of society, but not as both. And in the, in, for example, when you look at this health system diagram, there's absolutely nothing, no connection at all to um, the kind of preventative, uh, uh, preventative systems that we could implement in order to help solve and prevent future pandemics, such as promoting healthy food, clean environments, and then um, the, the way that chemicals and pollution also weaken our immune systems, make us more, more vulnerable. And actually studies show that in cities and areas that had more pollution, um, the pandemic had a higher impact and people, uh, the, there was a higher percentage of people that were, um, uh, who, who died or were negatively impacted by the virus. So this is sort of a more of an environmental way of thinking about disease not just in terms of as a medical problem, but also as a problem of society and nature. Okay, so now um, in systems thinking and in the realm of uh, um, environmental um, problem solving, there's this concept of the iceberg model of systems thinking that some of you may have come into contact with. So. It has these different levels. You have the event level, which is what's visible above the water, hence the, the metaphor, the visual metaphor of the iceberg. And then we always react to these events, but underlying events are patterns. So from a systems point of view, you wanna anticipate. So that's why we wanna think about what is the actual source of pandemics. You wanna anticipate um, future pandemics by recognizing that the loss of biodiversity is gonna probably um, create conditions where we'll have future pandemics. But then under those patterns, you have underlying structures and then the mental models that uh, create those underlying structures. So for example, if we look at environmental problems like insect decline, extinction, biodiversity loss, pandemics, global heating, disposable people, et cetera, these are visible events. These are things we can see that are actually happening. But rather than just react to sort of the immediate like, you know, if you have a forest fire, you put out the forest fire, that's like how we typically react. But going beyond that to looking at patterns, what are the things that are happening over and over again that are causing these conditions to reoccur, such as habitat destruction, intensive agriculture, pesticides, pollution, sacrifice zones, and then the underlying structures, which are the, the um, economic imperative of extractivism, monoculture, growth economics, enclosure, racism, and patriarchy, et cetera, are driving those patterns. But then even below that, what is the mental model? Well, anthropocentrism, modernity, mechanism, Cartesian duality. This is the level of epistemology. Um, and the idea, the, the reason why this model was developed is the, the, the concept is to create solutions and to create change, you, um, you can create greater change through leveraging from the mental model. If you change the mental model, then you can redesign and transform the systems, anticipate the patterns, and then react in a way that is more sustainable. So you all saw these graphics from the pandemic, flatten the curve. So what is the curve that we wanna flatten? Well, we, we need to flatten um, the economic system that is causing this kind of uh, widespread environmental destruction. And then from this, so from this point of view, I have a decolonial eco-justice perspective, which is to address the status quo of extractivism, sacrifice zones, and disposable people, and to address the growth paradigm in economics. So this is my personal imperative when I'm approaching media. So the idea is to, tra to transition from an anthropocentric to an ecocentric perspective. And, and that means that <clears throat> we have to identify the environmental ideologies that are prevalent in our systems. So an environmental ideology is uh, defined as a story about how the world was, is, and should be in the minds of the members of a group. So from an anthropocentric point of view, for example, what is valued is that nature is instrumental, it's there for human use. The rights that then are, are assigned to, uh, to the environment is private property, but the consequences are uh, a form of eco-apartheid, ecocide, and um, uh, environmental destruction. Whereas if you move, switch to an ecocentric perspective, you see 
the environment as intrinsic and having intrinsic value, then the rights you assign would be the rights of nature, land rights, and animal rights. And then you develop um, an infrastructure of relations based on caretaking balance, intergenerational justice, being, that's a typo, excuse me, a good relative and reciprocity. Now, just to be clear, I'm showing you the two extremes, but there's you know many positions that you could find sort of in between here. So I'm just showing you the two, the, 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 the range of ideology that exists. So we wanna transform our way of thinking about media from sort of the old idea that media is sort of this clean technology with no environmental consequence to really probing the environmental consequences of, of the media. So the methods of analysis that I use are <clears throat> the iceberg model of systems thinking and then um, the eco media sphere. And I'm gonna just focus on the iceberg for today for the sake of time. So there's different types of analysis you could do. You could analyze a representational media text. That could be an advertisement, greenwashing, news article, film, TV, et cetera. It could be a platform like a streaming service, a social network or a media organization or a chat GPT, something like that. Or it could be a gadget, an actual device, smartphone, tablet, computer, et cetera. Or a hyper object, which is an amorphous dispersed phenomena that behaves like a system. It's something that you can't actually touch, like the cloud, cryptocurrency, climate disinformation, or a media industry. And then the idea is to look at that media, eco media object through four different lenses <clears throat> eco culture, political ecology, life world, and eco materialism. So eco culture relates to what are our beliefs. And this is this form of analysis focuses primarily on language, symbols, discourses, and social practices. Political ecology, which is the study of how economic and power structures design systems and produce impacts on the environment, including the production of ideologies and material goods. Ecomaterialism is the realm of environmental and material conditions of media and the physical properties of a medium. And last but not least, life world or eco-affect is the ecology of perception and sense-making, our emotional experience, how media affect our senses, a sense of place, time, and space. So I don't expect you to read this whole diagram. It's very detailed, but this is how I've mapped out this method of analysis using the, um, the iceberg. The main thing to understand is that the iceberg model of systems thinking is used to identify how interdependent parts make up a whole system it offers the most leverage for change because transforming the knowledge system leads to system redesign and new structures. So now I'm going to model for you very quickly. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to go rather fast. But um, I'm going to model for you this type of analysis with an advertisement for Avion. So <clears throat> the event is the physical manifestation. It's the physical um, manifestation of the media that we're going to study. And at this level of analysis, we're just going to look at the formalistic properties. What we see, what, what is there, what, what is made of. This is the denotive level of analysis. So we just would describe, you know, there's a bottle, there's some pyramids, um, there's birds, there's waterfalls, there's the color green, just describing. So you're going to get students to look at what's there, make a list, and just be as comprehensive as possible, look at colors, look at shapes, et cetera. But then on the next level of analysis, we then examine the pattern of the object. So what I mean by that is then, if you go back, you'll notice that there's lots of symbols here and these symbols have different meanings and you wanna connect them to um, a range of meanings that exist across culture. So a lot of the advertisements you see for bottled water have very similar visual discourses, but those discourses are also connected to the history of art. They're connected to popular culture. They're not in isolation from the way that the environment is represented. And um, so if you were gonna do this type of analysis, you, you need to um, extend it just, I mean, you can look at, of course, the range of types of the genre of advertising for bottled water, but also extend it beyond that to see how these types of representations are also repeated in other types of media. And another characteristic of the pattern of the object is how does the how is the object itself, in this case, I'm talking about bottled water, what is its impact in the world? What happens? And so this is a nice diagram that some activists produced in South Africa about the hazards of bottled water. 
about how much waste there is, how much water it takes, and et cetera. But again, it's a description of um, how the, the, the object exists in the world as a pattern. But then what are the system structures that value bottled water? Why do we have bottled water in the first place as opposed to public water or um, you know, um, water that is not distributed through bottles, but through taps? So um, you have to look at the structure of the food, international global food industry, which is uh, primarily an ol oligopoly. And most of the bottled water companies, as you probably know, are owned by fast food and uh, soft drink companies. So why is the system structured right like this? Why do they extract water from public land, bottle it? That's an example of enclosure, taking something from the, that publicly owns, privatize it in a bottle, sell it back to the public, and then going to the deepest level of the system structure, what is the worldview? What is the knowledge system that produces that? Why, why does the economic system value this kind of behavior? And you, you could explore, of course, um, the origins of that, but you could also explore alternative worldviews, like the idea that water should not be privatized, that water is part of the commons, that it's something that uh, should be cared for, that should be uh, treated um, uh, should not be polluted, and et cetera. And then, of course, once you identify the knowledge system that creates all these other structures, the idea is then to be able to transform that so that we don't keep repeating the same problem over and over and over again. Okay, so that's a very superficial, brief example of how you do this uh, systems analysis, iceberg systems analysis of an eco-media object. In this case, I was looking at the, the bottled water advertisement. Okay, so I want to close with a quote from this wonderful science fiction book I'm reading now called The Terraformers by Annalie Newitz. And um, this is about um, a group of ecologists, rangers that terraform other planets. And um, there's this wonderful quote of the one of the rangers where she's in this space and she's trying to like um, figure out what's going on in the particular environment that she's working in. So I'm going to read you the quote. She tore her attention away from the tons of water bearing down on them and snapped back into network analysis mode. Take in the scene, look for what's there, but most of all, look for the relationships between things, find the systems. To me, this summarizes pr precisely the disposition of ecomedia literacy analysis. You wanna find the systems. So um, I wanna close by just, pointing your direction towards a uh, website I've created called ecomedialiteracy.org, where there's a ton of resources that I've been collecting. Um, but it's still kind of in a beta phase and I'm trying to solicit lessons from people. So I encourage you, if you take a picture of this QR code, it will take you to this page and you can send me an, an email telling me that you would like to uh, submit a lesson because what I wanna do is I want to encourage people who teach media literacy to take one lesson that they teach that they feel very familiar with and transition it into some kind of lesson about media and the environment. And the more people who participate, the more lessons we can put out there and kind of create, I hope, a movement um, so that we have a ton of people doing this work out there in the media literacy world. So we have some breakout questions. I'm going to... Um, I think I should probably copy these and put them in the chat. And I'm going to close the, um, yes, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to put these in the chat. And there they are. So uh, Davina, you take it over from here. Yes. Thank so you very I'm, much. I'm, yes, I'm just creating four breakout rooms. And um, let's see, you all have, 10 minutes because I really want people to come back and share and also ask some questions. Is that okay? Yes, I would love to have a discussion with everyone. I want to hear what you, your response is and what your ideas are. Um, so please, please share. Thank you. Hi, Antonio. Um, How are you? Hey, hey Joanna. Nice to hear nice. Right, so how is the breakout? 
We need more time. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> always, always <laughs> just getting to, into the beginning of things. And, and we I and that and we have to come back. Not that that's terrible, but we almost need a whole hour just to do the breakout. <laughs> But I also wanted us to have a chance to speak with um, Antonio uh, and to probably ask him questions as well as share the some of the things that we spoke about uh, in the breakout. So who wants to go first? Yes, Joanna. Hi, uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you may be. So I am I was telling the people in my breakout room, I'm at um, a workshop at my school. I'm a high school science teacher. Um, I'm going to be planning for the sustainability course I'm going to be teaching next spring and um i was looking at the 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 slide that you had about the um ideologies when i go to the website are those are you still going to be adding materials because i definitely want to use that for my course uh so i'm this week i'm i had some bugs that i'm trying to work out with my programmer but in the next few days there will be a lesson on environmental ideology and that slide will be there so if, if you don't see it by Wednesday or Thursday, send me a message. But uh, I today I was working on it and it should be up there I, in the next few days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob, you have your hand raised. Yes, we were we were talking about um, how uh, systems thinking in some respect, in many respects, is the opposite of a term that I use called fear-based thinking. Whereas fear narrows our focus and puts us into simplistic cause and effect mode and we put things into broad categories, systems thinking steps back and looks at the whole picture and that it requires balance to the extent that we're in a state of fear, we're charging forward and feel like we got to keep up, that we, we ultimately can't do it, that we need to restore balance and step back to see patterns and relationships and how things connect and, and work together and then ask the questions and a beautiful question that, that came out of the discussion is, is uh, ask why things are the way they are. <laughs> uh, that's not a question we can ask in a hurry or answer in a hurry. Yeah, I would like to briefly comment. That's such a wonderful point. Um, so I know that this idea of a left brain and a right brain has been kind of debunked because that's not how our brains are not so, you know, clearly structured that way. But we do have two different sort of primary modes of thinking that is reflected in our language in, in Italian, English, all you know, all other romance languages as well, where we have a way of thinking that identifies and specifically labels and names things. And then we have a way of perceiving that's patterns. So for example, we watch TV, um, but we see the person who's walking across the street or we see our friend. And in our society, in the literate, now I'm sort of dipping into media ecology and Marshall McLuhan a little bit. Uh, in a liter literacy-based society, print literacy-based society, we're primarily trained in sort of the, I'm going to use the, the, the wrong term, but the left brain mode of um, labeling and thinking in a very linear way, um, somewhat. Uh, also, the, this is where math takes place in language. And we don't cultivate the right brain skills to see patterns, to see you know, the, the way that things work in, broadly, which is more akin to music and art and things like that. So we need to be balanced between both ways of perceiving, see the systems, but also identify specifically the the, the kind of items where we, we label things and um, uh, do more like, decon that's more of a, like a deconstructive type of analysis. But th yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, please raise your hand um, to ask questions or to share about your breakout. And if you're still making up your mind, may I squeeze in something? <laughs> so you know when you gave example about about bottled water, that was that was so complex to me because I come from a country. I come from India, where sometimes even Indians tend to use bottled water because they don't want to fall sick. There, there are supply issues. The tap water is not always uh, reliable as you would have that in, in, in the global north. Um, but then, so, so it's very conflicting because on one hand, you have that argument that global south countries are developing and there's this um, attachment to 
Well, if you want to progress, if you want to develop, there's a cost that comes to it. Um, and climate change is happening rapidly here. I'm, I'm sitting with my hair tied up because it's 45 degrees Celsius where I'm at. It's hot. It's hot in capital letters. <laughs> and climate change is real. And it's not like our scientists are, uh, and our uh, you know, politicians are um, as amazing as the ones in the US who refuse to acknowledge that climate change exists. But then on the other hand, there's also a lot of sustainable practices that, that our um, traditional people use. So, you know, using clay pots, for example, having a water tank below your house to keep it naturally cool. And we're kind of going back towards those quote unquote traditional means of, you know, taking a more, moving away from the anthropocentric to the ecocentric and i don't know i mean so i don't know I if you know what my question is but just no no ahead. i understand um and in fact a lot of my thinking about water comes from examples from in india so for example there are many case studies in india where you have like coca-cola and pepsi extracting drinking water so the community no longer has access to drinking water and they're bottling that and they're using it to make coke and soda and selling it back to the people. And that's an example of enclosure where you take something that's a public common resource and then you privatize it. And it's a matter of priorities and how you structure your society. Because if, if, the, if the priority of the society is that we're going to allow this behavior, then it's gonna undermine the quality of, of the water that a public, a good, well-invested public water system could you know take care of those issues of, of contamination, but also, why is the water contaminated in the first place? You know, what's, is it, is it from industrial production? Is it from sewage? So those are all very important issues. And I want to just sit, mention and promote the work of Vandana Shiva, Vandana Shiva, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name correctly, amazing Indian activist and philosopher. And she's had a huge influence on me. So I highly recommend her work. Barbara has her hand up. Um, there is there's a film made in 2009, which I put in the in the chat called the first chat tapped, which goes explain goes through the industrial the industrial like Nestle's companies. They they're stealing water from communities and then they sell it. And in the United States, bottled water isn't even regulated, um, and the bottles, the plastic that um, is used is very, um, it has, it pollutes, plus it has cancer components to it. Um, but people continue to insist on, uh, on buying the water. And I, I just have to put in a plug for my old, my old, the, old, the place I grew up in is New York City. New York City has the best water in the whole country. People can't believe it, but they do. So, I don't know what to say. Everything is based on the money and at the expense of people. It makes no sense. By the way, some of the examples I gave in those slides were from advertisements in the Arab world. And, you know, it's, it's very fascinating if you deconstruct some of the advertisements, advertisements for bottled water in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, because um, I was doing some work in Lebanon and, you know, getting pulling out some examples from that region. And, you know, it's um, the, the, there's this sort of like a feedback loop between the, the way that we're consuming uh, or the way we're warming the planet is actually causing more drought and ca causing more water scarcity. And then that forces people into buying water from other parts of the world, which produces, which requires more energy and more plastic, et cetera. So we're kind of like in this I don't want to use the word, but like a death spiral, you know, we have to break out of that. That's why you want to do that systems thinking. So you want to really get into the root causes. of Why are we behaving this way? So other comments or questions? I was just going to add Antioch University in Seattle. I don't know if they still have it. They have a master's in systems thinking. So, yeah. Yeah. Discussion is kind of making me think. Sorry, Don, I'm just coming to you in a second. I wonder if anthropocentric needs to be changed and it needs to be labeled as profit centric instead. 
Donna, you have your hand raised. Your, your oh, microphone you. is off. Sorry about that. In our small group, a question was raised, which I thought maybe Antonio's um, lessons that he wants people to develop will be very helpful. And her question um, mainly spoke to the fact that so much of what the people, the world sees and how people deal with things is on a US example. And that's not a good example <laughs> because it, we're politically divided and so, not that other countries aren't politically divided, but the political wars going on right now are making it impossible, even for those of us who recognize that, know how to deal with discourses theoretically, but to actually get your voice out there in a way that's effective. I don't know what to do always. And I'm hoping these lessons, to, Antonio, that you're suggesting the world develop materialize and help us well i do a lot of teaching on and i'm not quite there yet with the website but i teach a class on climate writing uh, which is very much about how you do how do you communicate these issues you know media literacy has to be not just the analysis of media but also the making of media and if, if the goal is to encourage uh climate citizenship if that's i don't i just made that word up but you know get people activated yeah. Um, how do you, you, you also have to learn how to use these discourses. So when I actually teach climate writing, we also study discourses because you have to study how does the fossil fuel industry communicate? How do politicians communicate? How does popular culture communicate? And then how, how can you leverage that? Or also how can you change that? And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of work. So um, over time, uh, you know, it takes speaking of a lot of work. I mean, just putting up one or two lessons on my website took me days. So, you know, it's going to take me a year, a year to start just sort of constantly up, updating and putting stuff there, but also really want to build on the work that other people are doing. Like uh, Project Look Sharp has great lessons. I'll link to those. And so my, my aim, though, my goal is uh, to sort of crowdsource this and to encourage people, you know, if you're going to if you're doing media literacy work, do one lesson. I'm going to put up officially announced at some point soon a media literacy climate challenge. Take one lesson, make it oriented towards the environment, towards the climate. I'll share it, but you know, either I can, you know, I'm still working out the bugs. I can do all the formatting, put it up on my website, or I could just link to someone else's website, like Project Look Sharp has a very well structured system. Um, I view some of Renee's work on memes, and uh, and uh, doing climate memes. Like the her her uh, propaganda website has really good lessons about that. So I want to send people over there mm -hmm. to learn how to do memes. But you know, say let's do memes, but let's do a climate meme as well. I'm Other questions gonna, or comments? I'm going to point to one last comment in chat that Bob posted. Uh, he says, I've heard AI can be helpful in putting together lesson plans to provide clear direction information. Have you had any experience with that? I haven't tried. No, um, you know, I, I'm, no, I'm, that's good to know. I'm curious. I mean, I, I've been playing around with chat GPT and I find it helpful for things. And, you know, I'm also very critical of it, but, you know, I'm also taking advantage of some of the good things that it can do to save time. And uh, I'd be curious, I'm going to try that out. Uh, good. Good comment. I'm going to see if that works. All right. So I'm going to seize the time here um, and go to closing. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lopez and the audience for engaging so wonderfully tonight. Uh, what we have planned uh, next Media Club Monday, which is the 3rd of July, is we're going to be discussing this little book called Childscape, Mediascape, Children in Media in India. And here's the link to the book. It's an edited volume by Professor Usha Raman and Dr. Simana Kastori. Because uh, we speak a lot about children, um, but we don't have a lot of voices uh, coming out from India about children and what they do with media. So that's going to be fun. And in case you don't um, have it already, but I doubt that you don't because you're here. Uh, here's the Media Club Zoom registration. If you'd like to share that with 
your networks. We also have a wonderful AI in the Classroom webinar series. And unfortunately, we had some technical issues last time uh, because of which we couldn't do it on the 1st of June. Uh, what we've done is we've rescheduled it. It's now happening on the 8th of June. Um, and in case you want to join us for that, there's information in the chat as well as the Zoom registration link. Um, the next uh, AI that we're going to have that I just mentioned is on the 8th of June. It's in visual literacy, creativity, and authorship. And uh, I kind of asked Iglika, kind of completely forced her to use this one image that she's generated using AI where Professor Renee Hobbs is meeting Marshall McLuhan. And if you want to see that, you have to come next, uh, next time when you meet Iglika on the 8th. Um, and if you want to be a part of a uh, media club, you want to host a meeting, you want to join us for the webinar series, we, the current one is on AI in the classroom. Uh, we'll be launching the second webinar series in the second half of this year. It will be on inequalities in media education. Please get in touch with us. Um, my co-manager Jocelyn is here and I'm here as well. We handle the media club and the webinar series. So write to us and let us know if uh, there's something that we can do together for the media club or for the webinar series. That's all for today. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us and see you next time. Thank you everybody. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to hear people's ideas. It was very wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Keep cool, Davina. It's you're over a hundred Fahrenheit there. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs>